everybody. Hopefully everybody can hear me pretty well. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules, whether you're watching this live or in person. This is the ongoing global pandemic edition of veterinary medicine, right? We just keep on trucking. Um, hopefully you get a bite to eat while you're watching this. Um, I will be treating myself with my own ACC loop as I'm lecturing today. So let's get right into it a little bit. For those of you that haven't heard me before, I haven't met you at conferences and looking forward to being back at conferences and seeing folks in person again soon. I'm a diplomat at the American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation. I grew up in New York City, did my undergrad at Cornell, went to Ross and lived in the Caribbean for a couple of years after, and then did my clinical year at Purdue. I graduated in 04 and actually did mixed animal practice for the first couple of years, then moved to small animal practice, was doing orthopedic surgery, um, got rehab certified through the University of Tennessee's CCRP program, and kept realizing how do we keep managing all these mobility issues. And I added in Eastern medicine through tra training at the Chi Institute and my chronic pain management through the IVAPM. And then realized that rehab and pain management and OA management is a global phenomenon. So I joined the International Rehab Society, the IAVRPT. And then on top of all that, after being out 10 years, I went back and did a residency when the AVMA recognized sports med and rehab as a specialty. So I went back and did my career path residency and then moved to the DC area um, in 2017, took boards in 2018, and now I'm the medical director for the rehab department here at Veterinary Surgical Centers in Northern Virginia. So what are we gonna talk about? We really have to talk about pain in all of its aspects. We're gonna focus on osteoarthritis. Uh, just remember that even though it's not September yet, summer will fly by, every month should really be Animal Pain Awareness Month. And even if you may be changing from curbside to back to fully open in your clinics, find ways to have conversations with your pet parents about pain. We put up these flyers in exam rooms. We send them out on emails to start conversations because owners don't always recognize pain and they have a really hard time recognizing OA pain until they're in severe cases. So things like decreased activity, reluctance to jump, not going up or down stairs, not wanting to go on walks when they used to be happy about those, you know, are all signs of pain. Age is not a disease. Okay, so if just because they're getting older doesn't mean they shouldn't want to go on walks and do things. So start those conversations as a team approach. It's not just for us doctors, it's the techs, it's the assistants, it's our receptionists, starting to pick out where we're gonna identify pain patients. Some goals for this, we're gonna talk a little bit about pathophysiology and then really get into diagnosis and treatment. Um, what are some of the goals, right? Well, this for this dog, this is one of my hip OA patients and mom was really super happy that he was his hips were so comfortable that he could get up and eat off the toddler's um, high chair. Wasn't so great for his waistline, as you can see with this bulldog, okay? But his hips were much more comfortable. So let's get into some other goals for us. When we talk about pain, the big one that we always focus on is osteoarthritis. It's the most common form of arthritis in dogs and cats, as opposed to autoimmune or septic, things like that. And at least 20% of adult dogs and potentially as high as three out of five cats have radiographic evidence of OA. Whether that's clinical or not, is still always hard to tease out. I think we have to get better at being diagnosticians of OA and better diagnosticians of pain. Because owners are saying about one in three owners identify bone and joint problems as an issue for their pet. So we need to put this all together and figure this out because OA is the number one cause of chronic pain in dogs. It's affecting about 20 to 25% of dogs in the US, that's 20 million dogs. And that number was done before COVID when everyone went and adopted every dog out of the shelter and bought every puppy in sight. So that impact of OA is, you know, the simple stuff that we think about, right? Chronic pain, decreased activity, but then interfering with that human animal bond that we've all seen this past 18 months, right? Everybody's brought their pet into the clinic going, my dog's painful, my cat's painful, things aren't right. We need to get them better because we don't want this to wind up being a horrible quality of life issue where we then just are forced into a euthanasia scenario. 
The big one that I focus on now a lot is elbow disease. Um, this was actually showing that it's not just in the US, but this was a UK study that looked at owner response surveys showing the problems with elbow away as being the most commonly reported signs for this study was 20% of patients or 20% of clients reported their pets had decreased, um, difficult, had difficulty exercising. One in seven had pain. Three out of four had lameness. Okay. And elbow disease contributed to the decision to euthanize in 41% of dogs that died during that study. And you let that really sink in just looking at elbows, how much of a truly other type of pandemic we're dealing with. So what does this mean? OA has to be thought of as a global disease. It's not an isolated little disease. It's the final pathway of a failing joint. Articular cartilage is an organ. It crosstalks to other tissues. It protects the subchondral bone, right? We have to keep those all in mind. And for our dogs, it's almost exclusively a secondary phenomenon. And what does that mean? Elbow OA most of the time is secondary to elbow dysplasia. Hip OA, secondary to hip dysplasia. Cruciate, uh, stifle OA, secondary to cruciate disease. So when you're thinking about these, those that are on the front line seeing puppies do Ortolani tests and look at pen hip, feel those elbows, feel those ankles. We don't get as much OCD in the ankles, but we do get them. Find these early, be as proactive as we possibly can. That's our dogs. Our cats are actually usually primary OA. So usually it's a later in life phenomenon. They're good athletes. They have a deeper gene pool. Then on some of these other, especially some of the dogs that we all see, we know that, but cats get older and their cartilage gets worn out, but the age is not their disease. They can still be helped. We have a little more challenging sometimes cases with options for cats, but we do have some good options for cats for managing OA. What happens at the level of the joint? Because that osteophyte that we all see on radiographs is kind of like the pulmonary mets of an osteosarcoma. When you have a dog with an osteosarc in its leg, you know that 90% of those dogs already have microscopic metastasis, right? The, but they're not big enough to show up on rads, so we don't see them. Osteophytes, by the time they get to be two, three, four millimeters in size and be able to pick up on rads, have been living there for months, which means that that diseased joint has been battling stuff for months to years. So we have to look at that because that progression, right? That inflammatory disease, it's osteoarthritis. Anything that ends in itis is an inflammatory disease. So you get osteoarthritis from dysplasia, right? Then what happens is you get synovitis. So the synovial member gets really inflamed that overproduces metal metalloproteinases, interleukins, all these other cytokines that start to then degrade the joint make it effused, make it uncomfortable, eat away the cartilage, exposing that subchondral bone and making osteophytes. So at a microscopic level, OA has been happening for months and can happen as early as three or four months of age. And that all cycles together and comes back to it to create that vicious cycle of OA. But it's not just at the level of the joint. Those, that synovial membrane has pain receptors in it. So those pain receptors, even though cartilage is a neural, synovium is not. So it then sends pain messages up the nerves to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, up to the brain for low level chronic pain sensation. So this is where OA is a global disease within the pet. That then creates that vicious cycle of joint pain to motor dysfunction, and you could pick up this anywhere along the line, right? You could have structural modulation. What does that mean? They're compensating their gait because they're really dysplastic in their hips. They're really lax. That then creates sensitization. It creates joint pain, leads to motor dysfunction. And these dogs spiral into this. And it's hard to break this cycle. Because when we see that, we have to know our normals, right? So know that normal puppies should not have hips that pop in and out of socket. Know that if your wrist works fine, you should be able to bend your elbow all the way, sorry, 
If your elbow works fine, you should be able to bend it all the way that your wrist touches your shoulder blade and leave it there. It shouldn't be uncomfortable, okay? Normal elbow, if you put your finger on your olecranon and extend out to about 130 degrees, your thumb and middle finger should be in concave areas. If they're not, if it's flat or convex, that joint is effused, okay? So think about those types of things, feel all your normals. You're in general practice, you see hundreds of patients that come in for ear infections or parvo or GI issues, whatever else, feel all the joints. Take a quick couple of seconds, flex and extend joints, feel those. You'll get a better understanding of what normal is because then you can see your abnormal will start to stick out really easily. And by the way, that rule about effusion in concave and convex also applies to knees. So reach down, feel your own kneecap, extend your stifle, and go down to your patella tendon. And on either side of your patella tendon, your fingers should be in concave areas. If it's flat or convex, that joint's effused. That's how we can start to go in and figure out what's not right. We don't need them to be five out of five lame to figure it out. So what's the bottom line on pathophysiology of OA? It's a synovial disease. The osteophytes are the end stage. We don't always see the synovium on radiographs. So we're behind the eight ball a bit. When we make a diagnosis, again, dogs, it's secondary. So you still have to treat the primary, address the obesity, address dysplasia when we can. We'll talk about how to, you know, you can talk about how to do that with things like going in and shaving down the coronoids, getting in and getting into a strengthening program early, breeding for this appropriately, doing pen hip studies. If they're fat, check them for thyroid disease. Not that there's a plethora and a pandemic of hypothyroidism, but rule it out. If you see NeoA, double check for cruciate tears because most, most of the time, if you have NeoA, they have a cruciate tear. Or if they're really young, they might have an OCD lesion of the stifle. You can see those on APs, not always on laterals. But remember that any problem that involves or disrupts the joint will lead to OA. So communicate to the owners about this. Tell them what you're worried about, what you're trying to prevent, how we're trying to work as a team. The owners are going to say that, well, they're reluctant to jump, they're stiff, they're sore. Cats, here's fourth clinical signs in cats that cover 90% of cat diseases. Cats have reduction in activity, reluctance to jump, an unkempt appearance, and aggression. You could say that's OA. You could say that it's diabetes. Okay? So cats are much harder to figure out, but you can do them if you take the time and be patient. If you're doing your orthopedic exam, feel for muscle atrophy, joint swelling we went over already, feel for capsular or extracapsular fibrosis, reduced range of motion. Again, if you know your normals, your abnormals are easier to pick up. For the kitties, what do the kitties want when they're at the clinic? To be back in their carrier and go home. So put the cat up on a table, put the carrier on the floor, see how the cat jumps. Does it land like a sack of potatoes? Does it not want to jump down? And then reverse it. Take the cat out of the carrier, put the cat on the floor, put the carrier up on a table, see if it jumps back in. If it doesn't want to go do that, it's probably having some pain. And those are then enough minor clinical signs, subtle little hints to go get radiographs. Yes, they only provide some information. They're not 100% correlated. Yes, they're non-weight bearing. But they still are helpful because none of us were born on Krypton. None of us have x-ray vision. And that is important because when we diagnose arthritis in air quotes, and I get it, owners don't always want to spend money. It's a busy day. It's hard to get rads, but get rads when you can, because about once a month, I get a consult. I get lots of consults for OA, but about once a month, I have a consult that hasn't had rads and it's actually a tumor. And now we're behind that eight ball way behind that eight ball. So if it doesn't feel right, get some rads, make informed decisions. Because when you're looking at the rads, right? Like I said, stifle disease, okay? If you see stifle OA, and here's some signs, right? Spur off the caudal pole, the, the distal pole of the patella, trochlear ridge is thickened, a little bit of osteophyte formation off the caudal part of the tibia here, and there's that joint effusion, right? 
this little gray area should only be this big and look at it spread up underneath the patella, extend out towards the patella tendon, okay? If you do this as a sedated exam you can go back and feel for drawer and thrust, I will bet you this dog has a cruciate tear. And remember, not only cranial effusion, but look at all the subtle caudal joint effusion too. All of this should not be here in a normal pet. And there was a couple of studies that actually looked at dogs that don't have drawer or thrust awake and 50% of them will have it under sedation or anesthesia. So it's another good reason to do a sedated set of rads, get nice orthogonal views and get a good sedated ortho exam. You'll be a better diagnostician. How does that help? Radiographs do help to some degree, but they're not good for staging or monitoring. So I use other things like gait analysis, muscle mass measurements, goniometry to use as an indicator of some objective measures. But is there some subjective assessments that can be helpful? And yeah, out of the UPenn, the canine orthopedic index and the canine brief pain inventory have both been validated and designed specifically to assess OA. So we do them on their exam before we start treatment and then add our rechecks. And that's just like going to PT and they ask you to fill out those surveys. We're looking for improvement over time and they're free to download and use them in your clinics. Go to those websites, canineorthopedicindex.com, caninebriefpaininventory.com. They're there, go ahead and use them. Because once we get our diagnosis, now we can get into treatment and treatment is multimodal management. Short of joint replacement, we don't cure arthritis, we manage it. That can be through weight control and exercise, joint protectants, adjunct therapy, rehab, NSAIDs. We have two kinds of issues, right? We have the dogs that come in, their primary problem is they're gonna develop OA or those with incidental OA. So if they have a primary problem like a ruptured cruciate, don't spend 10 years managing the OA, go get a TPLO. TPLOs will halt progression of OA in about 95% of cases. That really works out well. But sometimes you just find a dog, they come in for acute gastroenteritis, you take some films, they have horrible hip OA. Were they lame? Is it impacting their life? Maybe the owners weren't aware, but that dog that comes in for acute GI signs does not need a total hip replacement the next day, but we need to start to have those conversations once that pet is stable through its current acute GI issues. Then you have some folks that come in that are like, my dog's arthritic. I know it's sore. Let's see what else we can do here. What are my options? And options are get good blood work, make sure they're healthy animals otherwise, that they can tolerate medications, right? And get them on NSAIDs. NSAIDs are still the best, probably quick response. We're gonna see improvement in two or three days. NSAIDs work at the level of the joint and they also work along the pain pathway at the level of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord and at perception of pain in the brain. So they can help with that a lot on different avenues. NSAIDs essentially by themselves are a multimodal approach to managing OA. But what happens when the owner says, I don't want my dog to live on pain meds the rest of their life. I don't, I have a pet who has renal disease or has an idiosyncratic reaction in its liver or a GI perf, and now it can't take NSAIDs. What if it's not working? And what if to some degree too, things aren't available? If, if medications go on back order, if they have other issues, where do else do we go? And we weren't designed in vet med to be just pill pushers, right? We're designed in vet school to be compassionate advocates. So we have to find other ways to help. That goes into that multimodal approach. So talk about fat, making fat dogs skinny again and fat cats too, okay? Obese dogs have more OA. Yes, that is a statement, but it's also backed by research. It's one of those, duh, of course they do, but we literally have papers showing that they do. And if we reduce the load and stress on the joints by reducing calories and improving regular exercise, and exercise is not running around the backyard, it's going for walks, we can lose weight and we can get these dogs down and we put less stress on their joints, we get them down in their weight. I like to use the BCS scale that goes from one to nine. So five is ideal, six is chubby, but for my OA patients, I aim for a BCS of four. 
Because if I fail at four, they're still a five and they're still lean. But if I fail at a five, they're going to be a six. They're going to be chubby and they're going to put more weight on their joints. Because this is the type of patients that come in to see me. This wiener dog had his own wiener mobile because he was so fat he couldn't walk. He actually came in to see me because they thought he had herniated a disc. He was just so fat he could no longer fight gravity. Okay. He weighed almost 60 some odd pounds, was not hypothyroid, was not diabetic. Okay. We got this dog to lose weight um, some, and then I lost him to follow up. So I worry that he's probably back up at this, to be honest. But this is the epidemic that we're dealing with. And we actually have a study of 50,000 dogs. They broke down by breed and by age and by sex and showing that dogs that are fat live less, live less, okay? If you're a dachshund and you're fat, on average, you live 2.3 years less than your lean body compatriot. If you're a Labrador, on average, half a year less. This is an open source paper. It's JVIM 2018. You can totally go out and get it and read it for yourselves. Put it up in your exam rooms. Start talk about how if your dog is fat, it will not be with your family as long as you want it to be. And it's going to be less. So make fat dogs skinny again. Because not only do we have the biomechanical stress of added weight on the joints, but fat is not an inert substance. It actually secretes adipokines that eat cartilage. So get them skinny. When we do that, we know they have less OA, we know they have less pain in people, and we have studies showing the exact same thing, that when we reduce weight, we reduce clinical signs of OA. So you can throw all the pills, surgeries, external options out to them that you want. The best way for them to have less OA pain is to weigh less. And then get them into rehab. This used to be a really fat ca uh, ca uh, Cavalier King Charles. And I said, what did he used to like to do? And mom was like, he used to like to run agility and then he got fat. Well, grandpa was overfeeding him. So we put him on a diet and he went back to running agility. Now granted, he needs some rehab therapy along the way and we incorporate different things into them. And you can incorporate rehab into your practices and start to get these patients moving again, build some strength after you've been a good diagnostician and figured out what their problem is. Because here's me playing with my own dog. How fast can you push him into different things? This is a prototype for a, basically a Fitbit for dog she was wearing, not a training collar or anything like that. And we're working on her core strength. And so she can stand upright for one to two minutes while I bounce her a little bit on this ball and she can still stay upright. That's how strong my dog is. And it's not only me, that's her genetics. I didn't train her that well. But if we use rehab therapy for OA, we're gonna improve muscle mass, reduce pain, and we can work on weight loss too. When we do that, get some simple measurements along the way, assess your body condition score, and give owners homework so they keep up with this. And one of the biggest exercises I have owners do for OA pain, walk. Start with 10 minutes, a couple of times a day, try to build up to more, average in maybe about, an, I try to aim for about 45 minutes to an hour, four or five, six days a week, get them out and moving a little bit more, okay? When we do that, we can add in other things so if we started with weight loss and NSAIDs, now we start to add in other things. That could be joint supplements. I use Adequan in dogs and cats. Still have NSAIDs for flare-ups, but I try not to have them take pain meds every day. But what OA management is not is here's your NSAID and your tramadol and goodbye, okay? It's not who we should be. It's not what our clients expect. They go elsewhere. And opioids are not great for OA pain, okay? especially tramadol. There was a paper in JAFMA a couple of years ago that showed that tramadol for OA pain was less effective than placebo, okay? And that's in your uh, AVMA journal. You can go out and find that article, the citations in the bottom right. There's a copy of it too. I put it in here, okay? Right? Dosing and big doses of tramadol, not weenie doses, but big doses of tramadol, five mix per kig, 
TID not as good as placebo. Polysulfated glycaminoglycans are FDA approved for modifying OA in dogs. This is basic, this is Adequan. Okay, you can use it off label sub Q. So I have owners do it at home. I also have them do it sub Q in cats. They have good um, anecdotal reports. Nobody has a paper on it, but it's one of my go tos for kitties because if owners can do insulin at home, they can do Adequan at home. Um, and then they can not have to come in as often. They can do it at home. It's not going to affect their other organs. Pretty much safe with that as a good starter option. Not for severe cases, but for mild cases can be a good starting point. We can move into some adjunct analgesics. The only one that we actually have a paper on that actually shows efficacy for OA in dogs is amantadine. And it's in conjunction with an NSAID. So it's not a standalone pain med. Everybody loves gabapentin. If you want to know how many efficacy papers for OA we have on gabapentin, the answer is zero. Okay. We don't know the dose yet for GABA. We still don't exactly know how often we need to give it. Everybody's a little bit different on them, but the efficacies are not there. But it's anecdotal and we think it helps. But again, we don't want to just be pill pushers. You can use Tylenol in dogs, obviously not in cats, but I do use it sometimes as a rescue analgesic if they're really painful. I don't really use codeine. If you're using Grapiprant, remember it's still an NSAID. You still have to monitor their kidney and liver functions. It does need to be given daily. It's not a PRN drug like carprofen or daricoxib can be or meloxicam. It does need to, grapoprint does need to be given on an empty stomach for absorption. And there are a couple of cases on the ACVIM listserv of acute renal issues directly related to this. So it's not a panacea of perfection. It's safe, absolutely, but it does need to be monitored. And it's not cheap either. One of the big ones that I go to, because what I think about it for managing OA is, what can we do systemically or inside to out? And we talked about those. We talked about pills. We talked about joint supplements a little bit, try to do those things. And then what can I do from outside to into that joint? And my big one, obviously, is I'm using it on myself too, is pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Kind of looks like an old TV antenna in some of these safer than a thousand cell phone batteries. And what we're doing with the ACC loop is we're targeting that um, and the nitric oxide that gets modulated for healing in humans and animals, that electromagnetic field therapy delivers the largest effective dose to that signaling pathway for nitric oxide. And each PMF device is different. So just like you have different radio stations for folks that still remember radio stations, Okay, we have different streaming channels, right? You have Netflix, you have Hulu, right? Everyone's a little bit different on what they do. Each electromagnetic field device from company to company has a different waveform. And when you have that different waveform, you're gonna have different efficacies. So you can't compare one to another directly necessarily. They're not interchangeable. Just because you have research on one doesn't mean you can use company two and say that the research is all the same because it's all dependent on the waveform of that electromagnetic field. When we enhance that nitric oxide signaling, right, we target that, it leads to an increase in blood flow and a reduction of pain and inflammation. It also modulates cytokines and growth factors to help accelerate wound healing and tissue repair. Benefit to the patient, we accelerate that, um, then we accelerate and decrease the, um, the pain and we accelerate that wound healing. And it's been FDA cleared for humans and people. And especially during a global pandemic, when we're all booked out for a month, these are things owners can do at home. We don't do them in the clinic that often. We do, but not that often. If owners do this at home, it's a 15 minute treatment. It's a couple of times a day. And then we taper to lowest effective have a really good treatment guide that you can get and follow along and trying to set up uh, parameters on when to use them. And what happens is the battery is here in the black and white pouch. The electromagnetic field is generated by the coil and it goes in both directions. And when that expands, it kind of looks like a football or let's admit this is vet med. This orange thing right now kind of looks like a whipworm egg, doesn't it? So when we do those, it expands in both directions. 
we can treat both areas, forward and back. We don't want to use it over pacemakers, and we don't want to use it um, if they have embedded neurostim or wires or electrodes. We don't want to interfere with that. But we do have good research on dogs that it helps. This was a paper out of AMC as a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial looking at specifically um, a CC loops after hemilaminectomies. So we had a control group, you had a treatment group, and the treatment group okay, had a better return to neurological function and needed less injectable pain meds and less oral pain meds as compared to the control group. There's another study looking at that same type of scenario. Again, this was, I think, out of NC State for the most part, looking at very similar ideas on this and how often they were treated with pulsed electromagnetic field and getting better. Um, in these, their conclusion was they reduced incision-associated pain in dogs post-surgery and may reduce extent of spinal cord injury and enhanced proprioceptive placing. So early trials, I think more research is getting done and will be coming out in the next couple of years, but good helpful evidence. With the evidence, then what are the benefits? We can use it over most implants. So you can use it over TPLO plates, okay? It's not contraindicated over neoplasia. So if you're working on cancer patients, working with cancer pain can be used as opposed to some other modalities like laser therapy or others that you can't. Provide some anti-inflammatory relief for those patients that can't take NSAIDs, helpful area to do. And we can do it over growth plates where as opposed to some laser therapy, we shouldn't be doing that because we can damage the growth plate and prematurely close it. That's not the case with pulsed electromagnetic field. Each loop has about 150 15 minute treatments. Costs are pretty reasonable. And if they use it long term, they actually make beds that are much more cost effective because if you just have a small loop for a Chihuahua, great. But if you have a great Dane that has two bad elbows, two bad knees, you're going to be, if they respond to pulse electromagnetic field, so I start them with the loop first, then we switch over the beds because they have 6,000 treatments in them. So basically a loop is about $2 a treatment. Beds come down to about 25 cents a treatment. So in summary, what do we want to do? We want to be proactive, not reactive. And we don't want to wait until severe cartilage damage occurs. We really want to look at weight loss and exercise are crucial in all stages. And we want to take that multimodal approach and include lots of pain management in your OA. These are some of the older guidelines, but these are the most recent ones. This is the 2015 uh, AHA and AAFP pain management guidelines. And I do know that these are getting redone and will be updated and be published. Um, I don't think this year, but hopefully next year or so as they finish up that project. Remember that OA management in a global pandemic or otherwise is always that multimodal approach. Find good things to utilize in your clinic, take advantage of those, work well with them, work as a team, communicate with the owners what our goals are, that we're here to manage this. Some good resources that are available. You guys can grab screenshots to these. These are always good, helpful things to have. And for those of you that want to learn more, have other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. It's my direct contact info. I'd like to thank Assisi for having me with you guys today. And what I wanted to really be able to do was open this up for Q&A. Uh, I think that's our best way to always really learn. So what we'll do is we'll put some stuff in the chat um, and we can answer some questions along the way. Um, and then there are some good promotions that Assisi is doing right now, which I can let you guys grab screenshots of that. And I'll put both of these up again. I'm going to flip back to my contact info and we're going to check the Q&A section because I see some stuff that's popping up. If you do guys need to jump out because I realize it's lunchtime and everybody's busy, on the East Coast and the West Coast, you guys may just be waking up or getting to work. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you have other questions. All right, thanks a lot, Dr. Brunke. Uh, we do see a few questions that have come through. So first one here from Sean. Is stem cell contraindicated when a pet is receiving chemo? Ooh, really good question. Um, it's gonna depend on the type of cancer. Um, because if they had bone marrow invasion cancer, then I'm not touching stem cells with a 10-foot pole. 
right? Because we don't know where they're coming from. If it's bone, especially if you're using bone marrow derived cells, that's a no, no. Um, and then we, if we have cancer patients, probably the safest way is to say we should not use stem cell therapy because um, we don't want to accelerate a tumor. We don't know enough yet probably about how those are really going to interact. So when I have cancer patients, I avoid stem cells. I avoid platelet-rich plasma um, for the most part because we just don't have the research yet on where, it's, where it could be utilized and we don't want to do more harm. Really good question. Okay. Uh, next one, Dr. Brunke, uh, we see this one a lot, but uh, let's say this is the best and by far the best lecture I've listened to. I work in Africa where vets are trained Jeez. to prescribe drugs. Gabapentin is very controversial. So how do you feel about CBD treatment? Oh, CBDs, we could do a whole day on that. Um, CBDs are the wild west in that there is no federal regulation on them in the United States. Um, I'm not even sure if there is on Canada as well. Um, and just like with joint supplements where there's no oversight, everybody's gonna be a little bit different. And we're still learning a lot on CBDs. There's a lot of good researchers out there. Uh, Dr. Joseph Washlag at Cornell, who did the original OA studies in dogs on one specific brand of CBDs. Uh, Steven Satal, who's a vet tech out on the West Coast, is one of the leaders in CBD research. Um, there's so many pathways in CBDs. Um, so you have, really have to find a validated source um, and attack certain pathways because certain uh, cannabis oils are gonna be better for OA pain. Other CBD lines are gonna be better maybe for seizures or for gastrointestinal discomfort. So we still have a ton to learn. The only one that I know of, and I don't keep up on all the current CBD research, so I apologize, the Elevet product out of Maine in the United States was the only one that had an OA study showing uh, mild efficacy. So that would be the one I would lean on. Whether that's available in Africa, I don't know. Um, email me and I would gladly come and bring some to you um, wherever I could be. Um, I'd love to learn more, but uh, that's the best I can answer on that one. Okay. Uh, Hannah says, great chat. Thank you for that. Uh, next question, do nitrous oxide tablets help with OA? Oh, good question. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know that we have anything showing that the nitrous oxide tablets have gotten into joints. Um, and we don't have, I don't think we have a dose paper on that one. Um, we'd have to have somebody show that. And to my knowledge, that's a, that's a you stumped me. Well done. Um, I don't know on that one. I haven't seen anything on it. Um, go to a university, get a research fund and get that figured out. <laughs> All right. Uh, question from Jessica. Can you use the Assisi loops and the Assisi loop lounge beds at the same time or do they cancel each other out? Ooh, um, for, I guess how, how big of an animal are you trying to treat, Jessica? Because if I can get the whole pet onto the loop lounge or the bed, then we're covering the whole pet so I wouldn't need the loop. Um, we use the loop lounges in our rehab offices. So when they're in for massage and stuff, they're laying on that and they're getting, you know, a multimodal approach. They're getting massage and PEMF at the same time. I don't think they're, they shouldn't counteract each other, but I don't, I'm having a hard time figuring out where you would need both at the same time. Uh, yeah. And I can add to that, Matt, my yeah. understanding is, um, you know, using a, a loop lounge and a loop at the same time is not going to give you any more PEMF. So, um, you know, if you, you've got an animal who maybe has multiple areas to treat, then I would definitely recommend a loop lounge bed as well. Yep. Okay, next question. Uh, would the dose of Adequin be the same in a cat as it would for a dog? Yes, I did not cover that one. Um, yeah, so essentially what it boils down to is it's one cc um, per 50 pounds for dogs. And we use the same dosages in cats. So it's 0.2 mLs per 10 pounds. Do it sub-Q twice a week for four weeks. And then in dogs, we say, that's, well, that's where the research ends, is twice a week for four weeks. Anecdotally, we do it about once a month thereafter. I do the same thing in cats. But like cats, I find I have to taper down. So I do 0.2 mLs per 10 pounds sub-Q twice a week for four weeks. And then maybe once a week for four weeks. And once every other week. And I have some kitties that have horrible OAing. 
that this one older Maine Coon kitty who was taking sub Q Atticon twice a week, every week for close to a year. Um, and we were watching kidney liver values as we do with older kitties anyway, and everything was going well. Um, they were doing pretty well with it. And then I said, well, I have this thing called an Assisi loop. Why don't you try that on the kitty as well? And the cat loved it. And we actually got that cat down to once a month at a quan, and they got a loop lounge and the kitty just goes and lays on its loop lounge. Um, so we detected it from a different pathway with that, but that's how you would use it in cats. Okay. Yep. Great. Yeah. Cats seem to love the loop lounge. Uh, they they kind of just really go into chill mode. Uh, let's see. Question from uh, Janae. Do you use an Assisi cl clinic bed or loop lounge during your rehab sessions? I'll let you answer that. And then yep. she'd ask when those will be back in stock for question for me. Um, I'll answer that real quick, Janae. I yep. don't have, know off the top of my head, but if you will email info at accanimalhealth.com, customer service can provide you with the info of when we might have those back in stock. Yep. And we do use them um, in the clinic. Um, so we've got those and those are really helpful for sure. Okay. Next question. Um, I think this is, uh, we answered this already. Lisa was asking, can you use a loop on a severely painful joint while on the ACC loop lounge? Again, no extra pimp if you're using both. So, you know, my suggestion is use one or the other. You're still going to get the same, same targeted treatment. Um, let's see, what is your favorite dorsiflex option for geriatric patients that start scuffing and knuckling? IVD ruled out. I'm finding the toe ups with boots are too heavy and not yep. helping as much as I'd like. Yep. Good question. Um, where I start with those is actually kinesiology tape. So I don't go to the toe ups. I take kinesiology tape, put it as a strip going from essentially the hock. We're assuming let's talk about back legs, make it those cases first although it'd be the same thing for front legs, but go from the joint, so either the carpus or the tarsus, down to about the metacarpal phalangeal joints. And I use kinesiology tape first, just to signal those proprioceptors a little bit more and see if that alone reduces the scuffing. That can work all in early cases. If you're doing that, then you don't need the mechanics of the toe up and the weight of a toe up. Um, the dorsiflex assist, not to endorse anybody in particular, the ones I like probably the most, honestly, are the Therapol ones out of New Jersey. Um, those might be the ones I would go to. Um, but the more I can actually address their core strength, underwater treadmill work, um, using kinesiology tape, getting PEMF treatments into those dogs, um, I'm finding myself using less and less boots. But that's my current thing. It's, there's not a paper backing that up yet. Okay. Uh, next question, why do some patients respond by trying to get away from the ACC loop during use? Are they feeling a sensation? And if so, why? That's a good one. Um, I very, 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 very rarely have that, to be honest. Um, like we talked about before, a lot of the kitties just kind of lay down and fall asleep on it. Mm -hmm. My own dogs fall asleep on it. Um, so there may be some patients that feel a little bit different. Um, and if that's the case, if they avoid it two or three times, we don't force it and like go and find something different for them to, for that can help them. Um, do you have anything to add on that one? You know, the only thing, my question would be is, is this an, a loop that's being newly introduced for the first few times? Um, my dog is a little skittish of it as well. She's kind of like, you know, what is, what is this that you're trying to put on me? So if this is something that you've tried multiple times, um, you know, it may not be something the dog wants to partake in. So my question would be is, again, is it something you're trying to do new for the first time or this is a consistent issue? Then I would definitely um, contact our customer service team at the info at accanimalhealth.com and let them know and uh, see if there's other options that we can look at for you. Oh, let's see. Uh, question from Jessica. What about using laser with pimp? Um, good multimodal approach. Sure. Um, not going to counteract each other. Probably use them separately. I'll be honest most of the time, except for the beds when we use them in the clinic. Um, I honestly have them doing PEMF at home. So we'll laser them in the clinic because I really don't feel like we have an effective laser for home use. And there's so many variables and safety features on laser that needs to be done with rehab professionals and veterinary professionals. So I don't have owners do it at home. But PEMF is a safe, easy way for owners to do it at home. So they would complement each other. That'd be a good one. Yep, great question. 
Uh, here's one from Judy. Is it okay to use the loop at the same time you are doing acupuncture and laser treatment? Um, laser, yes, that would be fine. Um, the acupuncture needles shouldn't be magnetized. We don't. I, one thing I left out real quick was I don't. We don't do PEMF in metal cages. Yeah. We obviously don't do them over pacemakers. I check that owners, not only because it's rare for us to have pacemakers in our veterinary patients, I always check with owners that they don't have a pacemaker because they like to put the loop or the loop, they'll put the kitty or the puppy in their lap and have the loop on. And if they have a pacemaker, that might cause some weird sensations for them. Um, acupuncture needles shouldn't be should not respond to an electromagnetic wave because they're stainless steel, so they should be good. Um, I don't see a reason why not. Do you have anything else to add on that one? No, we've not had any um, contraindications of using it at the same time. Um, you know, I would say on the safe side, maybe use it immediately after the acupuncture treatment, just to be yeah. safe. But uh, to my knowledge, we've not had any issues reported uh, with doing that. Okay. Uh, what would be best for a cat with stifle OA, a loop or a lounge? Um, I would start with a loop. Okay. And the, way, the way I always start with PEMF is I start with a loop because it's going to give us about eight weeks of treatments. We're going to see, are they going to start getting better? And then if they do, then they have the buy-in to then go get the lounge. That's my approach on those. Um, this way the owners don't have a, a bigger buy-in and if it doesn't respond or walk away from it, um, they have, you know, that's probably how I would look at those. Yes. Um, if they have stifle OA, cats do get cruciate tears. So if they're mechanically unstable, um, cats usually do not need a TPLO. They'll actually do really well with extra capsular repairs. So, uh, you know, address the mechanics too. Okay. Uh, question from Claire. I have cycloidal treatment for dogs plus the loop lounge and nutritional guidance and agility and core strength. Is this the right way to go about to control and help the OA conditions? Can you repeat some of that? The audio, audio got garbled. For a oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, so Claire says she has cycloidal treatment for dogs plus mm -hmm. the loop lounge and the nutritional guidance and agility and core strength. Is this the right way to go about controlling and helping the OA conditions? If it's working, I would say yes. If it's not working, then no. And, and that's you know, leads into a good point. You know, if you look at the original ibuprofen studies for the FDA to get approval for Advil, right? 85% efficacy. Carprofen, 85% efficacy. FDA will give you a license to sell stuff at 85%. But if it works in 85% of patients, that means in 15%, it doesn't. So if you think about all of us, right? If you have a headache, some of you might use PEMF, you might use acupuncture, you might laser your head, you might take ibuprofen, you might do other things, right? Everybody's a little bit different. So if it's working, great. If not, that's when I start to go, what else can we do and what are we battling? Um, are we still massively effused? I do a lot of intraarticular therapy then. Put the needle in, get the fluid out, put something else better in there to make a better environment, and then follow up with PEM for laser or things, maybe go back to that. So that's probably a good way to tackle those is if it's working, great. But if it's starting to see that it's not as the disease progresses, because we know OA is a progressive disease, it's not gonna stall out and, and get better unless we do something surgically, like um, a hip replacement, for example, then if it's working, great. But if it's not, start to revisit what other options you have. Okay. Uh, what position should the paw be in when placing the tape? I'm assuming the normal position. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. As long as it's on the dorsal aspect, the cranial surface, then we're fine. I don't put on the palmar or plantar surface. I just put it on the top. Okay. Uh, next question. Do you know when we might see the monoclonal antibody for OA for cats being developed by Zoetis? Uh, that's a great question. And I think it's getting released in Canada first. Um, I have no idea. I don't think it's this year. Um, hopefully, as we get back to major conferences, some folks will get that information out. I'm sure Zoetis, the best part of our answer is to ask you Zoetis rep. Um, they're going to have the most up-to-date info. Uh, at what height of the dog's limb do you recommend a water treadmill? Totally depends on the condition, right? Mm -hmm. So if where we have it is we have research that shows that when water's at the level of the hawk, 
their um, body weight is reduced by 9%. So they're still bearing 91% of their weight. When the water's at the level of their stifle, they're reduced body weight by 15%. So they're still bearing 85% of their weight. When the water's at the level of their hip, they only feel like they weigh 38% of their body weight. So depending on how afflicted they are and what we're trying to achieve, most animals I'm starting at hip height ish. So at the level of the greater trochanter, and then we're adjusting down to about the level of the stifle, which is where maximal resistance over maybe eight to 12 weeks. But if I have a DM dog, I might never lower it past their greater trochanter for as long as I see them. So it depends on what the disease is, what the phase of tissue healing is. Um, but most of the time I start them around the greater trochanter with all four feet still touching the floor. And then the speed I look for is speed of normal walking stride. Okay. Uh, next question from Lisa. I've used all kinds of things for my older dog uh, who is slipping and can't seem to find one that really works. She's tried the toe grips, the toe treads, the booties, the yep. adhesives yep. Um, work, but only last a day or two uh, for paw friction. Do you have one that you consider a favorite? Um, no. <laughs> um, I go more on the um, shave the bottoms of their feet and make sure you dremel their nails to an appropriate position. The more they can engage themselves, the better. And then what I try to do is find other things to address why they're not getting good traction. If they have LS disease, attack that more. If they have bad hips, attack that more. Trying to um, fight just the traction is a uphill battle of a fat, on ice, literally a slippery slope. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> next question. How do you work in charging for a sissy bed use with your patients during their appointments? Is it a separate modality charge? Um, you could go either way. You can separate it as a modality charge so you can track it. So, you know, when you've paid off the, the device, um, we also just incorporate into our land and massage sessions. So we just adjusted for that. Okay. Uh, question from Claire. What is the time gap between laser and a sissy loop lounge in a treatment? Um, you could, in theory, you could do them concurrently. Um, but like I said, most, and we do that when they're, you know, if they're here and they're getting laser on the PEMF bed, then we're there concurrently. Otherwise it's when the owners get the pet home. So I don't have a, a an answer for that one other than that. Okay. I don't think we have any evidence to, to say we don't, we can't do it. Right. Okay. How many treatments a day do you start when using the loop? Ah, it totally depends on what we're treating and the clinical use guide that I think is on. I know you can get it through a CC. Um, it's probably got the best parameters for that. A lot of the OA, I usually start at TID for about two weeks and then go down to BID. Um, in some of those research studies, like we we're looking at hemilambs, they were doing them every two hours for the first couple of days. Yes, and we recommend the same. So as long as the treatments are at least two hours apart, um, you know, you could treat as much as four times a day, depending on, you know, um, on the mm -hmm. issue, but, uh, treatments do need to be two hours apart minimum. Uh, yeah. let's see how many, oh, but I do tell owners too. when I do tell owners on that one, right. Is it's also as important for the owner to get eight hours of sleep and the pet to get eight hours of sleep. So do not wake up every two hours to pimp for your dog, get a good yeah. night's sleep. That's just as important, please. Sleep and rest. Uh, agreed. Very much agreed.